Okay, it looks like we are live. Welcome to our discussion on the 19th Amendment. I'm Jennifer Napier Pierce. I'm the editor of the Salt Lake Tribune. Tremendously grateful to the Hinckley Institute of Politics and the University of Utah Alumni Association for putting together this really uh, important and timely discussion on the 19th Amendment. Um, I do want to read the amendment so we're all clear and on the same page. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That's 28 words that made the, a huge difference for women across America as they gained the right to vote 100 years ago this year. Uh, on this hour long discussion, we're gonna talk about why it took so long, Utah's role in making this hap happen and sort of the trickle down effect of the 19th Amendment over the past 100 years and looking forward. We have so much to talk about, we have a limited time. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our distinguished panel of experts, Dr. Martha Bradley. She's Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs at the University of Utah and a scholar on women's history. Uh, Professor Bradley, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Also Representative Karen Kwan, she's represented Utah House District 34 since 2017. She's also uh, the sponsor of the Equal Rights Amendment, which has resurfaced. And Representative Kwan, thanks to, for your time today as well. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for hosting this, Jennifer. Of course. Thank you to the Hinkley for hosting it. Thank I know. I think it's great. Um, Janetta Williams is also with us. She is uh, the longstanding president of the NAACP Salt Lake branch. And Janetta, it's great to see you again. And uh, Catherine Kitterman is with us, Historical Director for Better Days 2020, a nonprofit dedicated to making Utah women's history accessible. And Catherine, welcome to you. I'm not sure, um, I'm not hearing you, Catherine. Are you muted? Nope. Okay, great. <laughs> Glad you're here. Um, if you've got a question for our distinguished panel, please submit that in the chat window on YouTube, or you can send an email, jot down this email, clubs at Utah, excuse me, clubs at alumni.utah.edu. That's clubs at alumni.utah.edu. We'll fold all of those into this discussion as we go along. Um, before we get into the meat of the 19th Amendment and uh, the history that followed that ratification, I, I'd love to just kind of set the scene about what the 19th Amendment means to each of you. And uh, Representative Kwan, let's start with you. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Um, you know, it the 19th Amendment means so much more to me um, as a woman of color than uh, what I thought. Uh, when I first started researching and looking into ERA, I realized the rich history that women of color had in um, advocating for, um, you know, for the uh, women's suffrage. And that was a surprise to me. So it really is a, a very a proud um, moment when I learned uh, all of the uh, women of color. Um, there's actually a post office in uh, New York's Chinatown that's named after uh, a suffragette. Yeah. That's terrific. Um, well, that, Janetta, let's toss it to you. What does the 19th Amendment mean to you? Okay, the 19th Amendment means to me the opportunity that women take a stand. And they, when I look at the suffrage that the women had uh, back in the early, you know, 1900s and 1920 was that uh, later on when we did the civil rights movement, uh, the hoses that that people were, you know, in, you know that people did um, have to face, and then look at all of the suffrage that the women had to face too. That a lot of the men didn't want them to have the right to vote, so they you know, went out and, and hit them and beat them and all of those type of things. And then looking to the, you know, the modern day uh, civil rights movement, you know, we can see that all of those different things came together as one. And one of the things that was amazing too at that time was when the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, they had started and there was only 22 of the group, but then they went and 
participated with the movement as well and the march. So Catherine, I guess it is part of the, the rich tradition of the civil rights movement in uh, Utah and US history. What does the 19th mean to you? Yeah, as a Utahn and as a woman, it's interesting to look back on that moment. I think a lot of people are celebrating this as the day that ended all problems for women in voting. And that's not quite true, right? But it was a really big step forward. And it took decades of struggle for women across the country to get to that point. And then we know that women of color continued that struggle for equal access to the ballot coming up. Um, but one of the things that's been so important to me as a Utahn over the last couple of years is to learn about local heroes. So Sojourner Truth and Susan B. Anthony are interesting people to learn about, and they did a lot, but it's been interesting to me to learn about our very own Utah, Susan B. Anthony's and Sojourner Truth's and other women who took a stand and pushed against situations that they thought were unfair to make a difference for themselves and those of us that would follow. We will certainly get to that, um, but um, uh, Professor Bradley, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the, the significance for you for the 19th. I'm so glad we're talking about the 19th Amendment in the way that we are, because um, the women's movement really began in Seneca Falls in 1848. And if you think about what was going on in the United States at that moment in time, we were thinking about human rights in more serious ways and how, they, how human rights applied to men and women and, and individuals of different races. And I think the history from that point to the passage of the 19th Amendment is part of that larger context of conversation about how do we make laws more equitable, more fair to all people, not, not just women, but um, during the 1870s, it was about um, extending the vote um, and recognizing human rights for African-American individuals as well. Same thing was true with uh, ERA in the 1970s. If you remember the Civil Rights Act, the Equal Pay Act, that context was again thinking about how we expand civil rights, human rights um, across the board. So, you know, if it, if it was really starting to um, gain some steam in the night in 1870, why did it take so much longer uh, to, to push this? this amendment through. I mean, we're talking 1919, 1920, the aftermath of World War I, uh, the Spanish flu pandemic, which we're all familiar with now. Uh, there is a presidential election component to this. And the suffragists, how did they, how did they push it over the line? What were the specific societal influences that we were seeing right, right around 1920? Uh, Professor Bradley? So really starting around 1870, um, there were a number of different things that needed to change before uh, America was even ready for um, suffrage. And that included simple things like um, in the 1870s, women would have been considered the property of their husband. So being recognized as an individual who could own property in and of themselves. If you remember anything about the progressive era, um, and all the protective legislation we put in place that protected women in the workplace because more women were working. All of those individual changes uh, led up to a moment where we could embrace the idea of, of, of voting rights across the board. So it took a long time, but there were really important steps all along the way that prepared the landscape for that to happen. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the congressional debate? Like, what were the arguments against it? What were some people saying, you know, women should have no place at the ballot box? So um, we always focus on the suffragists, right? And the arguments they were making uh, for women to have the vote, but there were also anti-suffragists who were building really compelling arguments about women not being intellectually as capable of, of voting in a rational way. Um, that women would always follow their husbands rather than voting for themselves, that it would be a complicated uh, compounding of the vote of a man. So the anti-suffragists were really focusing on what they believed was the meaning of the difference between men and women, rather than considering women as an, an equal citizen, an equal human being alongside men. 
Oh, that we've heard those arguments quite a bit throughout history. Um, Catherine, I'd love to hear the, the Utah perspective. So take us back to 1870 and the debate that was broiling here in the territory. Yeah, Utah has this really unique role in the suffrage movement because we were the second territory that extended the right to vote to women citizens. And that happened in 1870. But because of the timing of elections, um, we beat Wyoming women to the polls. So Utah women had the distinction of casting their ballots first. And that included some women, but of course that didn't include women who weren't considered citizens at the time. So Native American women, many women of color wouldn't have been included in that. Um, but it was an interesting step forward. And that happened because in many ways, there was a, a debate going on about the Mormon practice of polygamy here in Utah in the 19th century. So that was all tied up in this. Eastern suffragists and Congress people thought if we give women the right to vote, they'll be able to vote themselves out of polygamy. They'll end the system that we're trying to end. Um, and the people in Utah thought the opposite would happen. Um, but so these discussions that happened around whether or not women should vote and whether or not they could, they only could happen here in Utah because people were willing to make what seemed like an experiment, right? That, that um, nobody would be crazy enough to try that in New York state at this time, right? They're not able to get the legislatures to consider that. And then as Utah women start to vote and continue to vote, they attract a lot of attention and scrutiny. People are looking at the way they're voting. They're looking to see if polygamy is somehow going to topple here. And when that didn't, then a lot of reformers and people both inside and outside Utah started to argue that women's vote should be taken away because they weren't voting in their own interests. And in many ways, some of those anti-suffrage arguments that Dr. Bradley mentioned were leveled first against women in Utah saying they're just voting the way their husbands are telling them to, or they're too irrational to vote, or you know they're not really interested, they're just being told what to do and so they show up. Um, and all of these arguments about whether or not women should have a place and how they should vote and whether or not they're voting in the right way, those really set the stage for arguments that would come into play decades later when the rest of the country was considering this issue seriously. So in many ways, Utah women paved the way. They lost their voting rights then in 1887 because Congress took that away as one of a couple of measures they were trying to do to end polygamy. So there was a lot of back and forth and high drama, but in that intense focus on what women were doing here in Utah, there was an opportunity for women to step up and show their side of the story as they saw it to, to explain why they wanted to have a say in political affairs as well. And some of that legacy carried through well past Utah women regaining the vote with statehood and, and carried as Utahns were some of the strongest supporters of the 19th Amendment moving forward. What does the history tell us about um, uh, women's experience voting and then having that right taken away? Um, are, are there particular documents that point to <laughs> uh, outrage, dissatisfaction? Um, I, I don't know what the reaction was of women at that time, but it, to me, that would be such an affront Yes, one of the best places is the Woman's Exponent, which was a, in many ways a pro-suffrage newspaper published here in Utah from 1872 all the way until 1914. And so in 1887, when all Utah women lose this right to vote, you can see a lot of people writing in saying, we've been citizens, we've been having our voices heard, and this is an affront um, to our rights of citizenship, right? Um, and all through the late 1880s and early 1890s, Utah women gathered in Utah women's suffrage associations across about 21 territories, as far as we've been able to tell. Um, so you can think of this as the city women, but this is also farming women and recent immigrants and people across Utah coming together to say, we want to have the vote, we want to prove that we're ready, we want to teach each other about political issues and gear up and really lay the groundwork to hold men's feet to the fire, that when we get statehood, we get this vote back. And you can see that they really laid a careful groundwork and, and planned that out well, because they felt that that was such an important right that had been taken away. And I should mention, Utah is the only place where Congress took women's voting rights away, but there were some other places, other territories where women lost voting rights for different reasons, and legal technicalities, things like this. And I think that shows this story again, that, that voting rights are not always a progression, a linear progression forward, but there are steps forward and steps backward as well. Hmm. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the, um, uh, the role that Utah women played in the national debate? Um, obviously, you know, Utah was an outlier a little bit in front of this. Uh, they had a, a renewed resolve when that right was taken away. How did they step into the national debate for women's rights? Yeah, Utah women were invited to be part of one of the suffrage organizations, um, the, the organization led by Susan B. Anthony that was willing to work with women in Utah, um, invited them to come and speak back east in Washington, DC. So you'd often see Utah women speaking as voters or former voters 
in, in Washington, D.C., you'd see them testifying to congressional committees. And especially after statehood, there were only four states in 1896 where women could vote. They're all in the West. That's Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho. And you see people pointing to that example. So for example, Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon, when she was a state senator, testifies in Washington, D.C., saying none of those unpleasant results have happened here. When women vote, the sky doesn't fall in. We still take care of our homes. You know, all of these worries and fears that the family would collapse. These women were trying to use their experience to show that that wasn't the case. And Utah women also punched above their weight in, in holding their own elected representatives to account and ensuring that they would support and move forward the 19th Amendment in Congress. And they also gathered petitions, supported leaders, raised funds. In fact, in 1910, Utah um, gathered petition signatures for a 19th Amendment and gained almost about a tenth of the signatures that were gathered across the country. So you can see that Utahns, uh, both men and women, continued to support this notion of women's right to vote after they had regained that here for themselves. Professor Bradley, anything to add? On well, yeah, I, I uh, wrote a book a number of years ago called The Four Zinas, which was about Zina Diantha Young, who was married to Brigham Young, and then her daughter, Zina Presendia Young. So when Zina Diantha was the leader of the churchwide Women's Relief Society, she asked her daughter, Zina Presendia, to accompany Emmeline B. Wells to this convention that Catherine was describing. Um, and they, they um, participated fully with all of the conversations. They met with Ruther Rutherford B. Hayes uh, and George Edmonds, who was the person who drafted the Edmonds Tucker Act, which took the vote away from women. So, I mean, these women, they took their role in national politics really seriously. <clears throat> and oftentimes when they were at that meeting, they were ridiculed for their position on plural marriage, but they held their ground because they, felt they, they didn't see that the two were incompatible. They fully embraced women's rights at the same time they were faithful members of the LDS Church who were promoting a certain uh, way of life. So how did women's lives change in 1920? Did they show up to vote? What were the voting turnout um, numbers? Dr. Bradley, do you have anything? Well, when I've looked at it, what is most prominent is that the trends don't change at all. Uh, for the first few years after, wouldn't you say, Catherine, that they, yeah. um, at, for the first few years after women start to vote, um, they're voting in the same way that their husbands are voting, most likely. Um, and, and it really will be quite a long time before we start seeing women voting as a block and favoring certain uh, political issues over others. But in the wake of it, there's not much change. Uh, was there a celebration here, Catherine? <laughs> were, were there parades? Um, you know, was there ticker yeah. tape around <laughs> voting day, election day? So maybe not ticker tape, but there were big parades in at the end of August and September when the 19th Amendment was ratified and became part of the U.S. Constitution. Um, Utah women celebrated that because, again, they've been part of this movement for the last five decades. Um, not many of them continued on, right? There, there was still work to do, but I think they saw this as an important step towards women's equality. The idea that you can't be kept from the ballot box simply because you're a woman. So that removed one layer of difficulty at least. Um, interestingly though, we have found that in February of 1920, when women were gearing up celebrations to celebrate the 50th anniversary of their suffrage here in Utah, they had to cancel a few events because of the flu. So history repeats itself again this year. <laughs> sure does. Um, what about for women of color, Janetta, um, Representative Kwan, uh, you touched on this a little bit. Do you think that women of color view the 19th Amendment any differently from women just generally? Is that for, for me? Yeah, go for it. Okay, sure. Uh, I think uh, that people do see it differently. Uh, number one, because the black people did have the right to vote during that time, but then of course they lost it. There were roughly about 22 men that were elected to, to Congress. If, you know, people probably are kind of a surprised to know that as well. But uh, even at that, they made it harder for uh, African-Americans uh, to vote. Uh, they were made, had questions coming up, you know, how many uh, bubbles in a bar of soap, uh, how many marbles in a jar, you know, just different things that made it so difficult 
for blacks to even vote. And so they-, Wait, they what do you mean by that? I, I, I don't know about the marbles in a jar. What is that? Oh, they just, just different questions that they ask uh, blacks when they had to go trying to vote. I and see. if they couldn't answer these different questions, then they were not allowed to vote. I see. And so they, they, they just made it harder for, for them to even vote. And then that's why all of those different things led up to the 1965 uh, Voting Rights Act. And so when, you know, people got the, Blacks got the right to vote. Because even at during that time when um, Native Americans were here in this country, of course, but they were not allowed to vote because they were saying that they weren't citizens. And so we have all of these different people that were not allowed to vote. And then the fight had to continue. As we say, the struggle continues. So we saw a lot of those different things that hindered folks from being able to, to even just vote. And that's why even today, uh, voting is so important to, and it should be important to everyone that we always urge everyone to, to get out there and vote because uh, the, so much you know, fighting went on uh, to try to make sure that people were able to uh, register and then to vote. Representative Kwan, I mean, as we've sort of recounted the history, there's a lot to celebrate, but you can see the gaps, right? I mean, it, this is not uh, a debate that's over. It's something, disenfranchisement is real, even today. Yes, absolutely. We do see that um, disenfranchisement. I want to uh, touch upon what Janetta had said. In the Chinese American community, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act, which went from 1882 to 1943. Now, this excluded any uh, anybody uh, from Chinese ancestry to become a naturalized citizen, um, barring us the right to vote. Um, and we did have, uh, in some of my research, I was very um, proud and surprised to find that we had um, women suffragists uh, back in the early um, uh, uh, 20th century. Uh, Mabel uh, Lee, actually there's a post office named after her uh, in New York. She uh, could not become a naturalized citizen um, and could not become a naturalized citizen um, even though she came, I think she came to the US in 1905. So she, and she was very young, maybe five or six at the time. She couldn't become a citizen until after 1943. But she uh, rode on horseback through the streets of New York to, um, to uh, 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 talk about um, and advocate for uh, women's suffrage. She said, here's a quote from her, that equality of equality of opportunities to women were the hallmarks of true feminism. And she did this even though she, she knew that it wouldn't benefit her at the time. I mean, and we still see this kind of um, feminism and hero, um, uh, heroics from our women and women of color. We know that there are many people who are barred from our voting um, uh, process, whether they have citizenship or not. Um, and when I say whether they don't have citizenship, they, we, we have uh, women um, and, and men who um, are on, for example, in the uh, uh, Navajo Nation, who um, were barred their right to vote. Um, and so we see this today, but yet we see this kind of uh, standing up for all, standing up when we see injustice for one, then it's injustice for all. You used the F word. <laughs> How dare I'm that. curious to hear uh, the perspectives of uh, Catherine and Professor Bradley, whether or not the suffragists would consider themselves to be feminists. Well, Mabel Lee did. This, that was her quote. She um, did. Okay. I'd like to see, you know, I, I'm interested to hear the answer from her. Yeah. Well, they certainly didn't use the term feminists, but they were talking about equity, which is at the core of how I would define feminism and fairness. Um, and, and they had a really strong collective sense of each other. They weren't just doing it for themselves. They were doing it for their daughters and their sisters and their aunties and women as general and in general. And 
you know, if they hadn't used the term feminists, we could have used it to describe them because they certainly manifested the spirit of what feminism has represented through time. Mm. Catherine. Yeah, and I think, um, as Dr. Bradley said, as that term comes into usage later, you can look back and look at many of these women, and especially when we think about the suffrage movement and we think of it as a narrow movement for voting rights, as Dr. Bradley mentioned before, this was this was a movement that encompassed so much more, um, fighting for so many other things for women. And we found interesting stories, you know, right here in Provo, the Ladies Democratic Club in 1900 holds a little protest saying, you're paying the, the female county clerk less than the male county clerk, what gives? Um, so there were women who were talking about equal pay and, and thinking about issues of equity again and belonging in ways that I think that we would read back on that. Um, and again, I think seeing that this was a, a movement not just for my own personal situation, but trying to level the playing field and trying to make sure that there was actually equal access to opportunity. And that's something that we can read that back on. So the, those early suffragists, they didn't shrink away when they got the 19th Amendment ratified. <laughs> um, they just took on another cause. Is that is that the case? Many did. And um, for example, Alice Paul, the leader of the National Women's Party, then went on to write the Equal Rights Amendment, as, as Representative Kwan can talk about. So a lot of these people saw the vote as the first step or an important step, a tool that they could then use um, for other things to hold representatives to account. But there were other issues that they then moved on to. Hmm. Representative Kwan, that's a, a nice segue into uh, the debate that's still roiling today around the Equal Rights Amendment. Yes, <laughs> there is a debate. And you know, I actually came to this debate um, quite late. Um, I didn't understand, I didn't know the, the long history of ERA here in, in Utah. Um, and uh, it was uh, Dr. Bradley and, and Catherine and others, uh, historians who really taught me um, about the, um, the rich history that we have. And so I thought quite naively, let's um, tap into that <laughs> and see uh, where we are now. Um, it's, it's interesting that um, early on, I, I believe from 1973 to 1970, I think it was 1978 um, or nine, there were three um, uh, attempts to pass ERA here led by women, all three women, um, and they didn't, they didn't pass. Um, and then the, up until uh, 2017, there were, oh, five or so, five or six different um, ERA bills, but they were all anti-ERA. <laughs> and my, uh, just quickly looking over the names, I would guess that they were all men. <laughs> um, uh, so it's interesting because in 1979, that was the only ERA related uh, bill that passed in Utah. And again, it was an anti-ERA bill. It not only said, we, we won't pass ERA, we are against ERA, but we will never pass ERA. <laughs> and um, it's, you know, we really have lived up to that <laughs> since <laughs> then. So um, I, was, I was actually quite surprised at, not that there was pushback, but the type of pushback and where, where that came. Uh, where that came out of. I, I don't know if you want to get into Well, I, I'm curious um, from uh, Dr. Bradley, um, contextually, are, have the arguments changed since ERA came on? Do they somewhat sound familiar from what we saw in the 19th Amendment arguments? I'm just, uh, you know, just trying to bring the whole context together. Well, you know, if you think about the world since 1972, everything's changed, right? And the arguments that the anti-feminists or those who were opposed to the ERA used were the threat of women in combat or the threat of same-sex bathrooms or the, th the threat of more women going into the workplace. Uh, and many of those things have happened just through the normal course of things. And so the same arguments don't hold water because they actually have become normalized in modern society more, more generally. But I, I, I listened to the um, 
the press conference representative Quan, when you when you talked about ERA and so, some of the comments at, after that were ones that could have been voiced in 1972. It's kind of like old news, right? Um, and so we're, we're just dealing with a very, very different context um, where so many positive social change changes have changed the role of women in society and, and gained respect for women in a really different way from, from ever before. Hmm. Representative, so <laughs> what are the lessons that you take from that? Because if the, the arguments against ERA have already sort of played out in you know, someone's lifetime and didn't cause catastrophe. Um, how do you, how do you move the ball forward at this point? Um, so I knew that this was going to be a multi-year process. Um, it's it, it, not only are they the same arguments, a lot of times it was the same people like the exact same people making the same arguments. Um, and then also on the other side, um, I had a lot of support from women who uh, fought for ERA. In fact, yesterday I got a phone call from somebody who said, you know, I was um, down in Utah County. I remember um, rallying and I remember the kinds of things that they were saying then. It's the same kinds of things that they're saying now. Uh, and what surprised me is that three fourths almost three fourths of our uh, population want uh, ERA to pass. Um, they don't see a problem with it. They, and many of the, our younger um, constituents are saying, I thought we already had it. You know? So I thought, okay, well, enough time has passed that we can have a new conversation about it. Um, and uh, I didn't, of course, I didn't do this alone. There is a, um, a team of, of men and women um, Dr. Bradley, thank you. And I mean, everybody that's on this panel has helped. Um, uh, and so we, we talked about starting anew and how we can start anew. Um, and what surprised me is how um, emotionally charged the arguments were against it and they didn't um, incorporate any of the new um, arguments in support of it. It was just totally um, sort of ignored, right? So the, the new arguments about making a, um, a, what I wanted to do was talk about making this grand gesture because it, legally the, um, passing the ERA isn't going to do anything for us in Utah. It's not gonna change any law at all because we basically already have it. Actually, our mm. language in our constitution is more robust. So, um, I pushed that argument. In the ERA. Yes, okay. the ERA, I'm sorry. Um, so I pushed that argument out uh, that the ERA wouldn't have anything um, legally, wouldn't impact any, anything. And so I thought, oh, well, in all of those arguments about legal, um, um, the, the pushback, and well, that's all taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> right. So again, quite naively, the arguments that we were getting against it were very emotional. And it's, we can't argue legal when the opposition is coming from an emotional standpoint. It's a, it's a different kind of, of, um, of argument. Um, and that's what I was seeing in the, uh, in, you know, in the house uh, is the people that uh, we're going to vote against it. We're bringing up um, uh, very emotional arguments. Mm -hmm. Janetta, do you see the the debate around the ERA very much in line with the the um, the proud tradition of civil rights, um, the Nineteenth Amendment struggle? Is is this just part of the continuum? Yes, I do see it that way because. When we look at the ERA and the legislation that Representative Juan did, you know, we did see a lot of opposition. And a lot of folks were saying, you know, why is it so much opposition to this? Well, it's the same thing that happened during the civil rights era as well. There was so much opposition as, as the Voting Rights Act. And people were saying, well, I thought Blacks already had the right to vote. And, you know, we, you know, what's the big fight about? You know, why are there so many marches going on? And I think people just don't take the time to really maybe sit down and read or listen 
to exactly, you know, why are these things so important? And then when we talk about the ERA and wanting to make sure that, yes, Utah did vote in favor of it, that, you know, why, you know, why not? Uh, you know, why can't we all come together and vote for that? And people may have emotional reasons why they're opposing it, but then they need to look on the other side too, is why would this be a good thing for, for Utah to have? And same thing about the Voting Rights Act. You know, why is it that, you know, we need to look at it every so often, every five years to make sure that the states aren't putting in different roadblocks so people don't get the right to vote. Uh, so, you know, why, are, why is it that some of the Southern states were looking at roadblocks to keep blacks from being able to vote? And so, we, you know, we see all of those type of things and then we, we go to Congress and we go for the, you know, asking them to, to support us. Uh, we go to the Supreme Court asking for uh, support. And then, of course, in 2013, when they got it, the uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, then since then, uh, NAACP and other groups have worked together trying to make sure that a lot of these states aren't putting these, I keep saying, roadblocks in the way so people will be able to, to go and, and vote. Uh, why can't they do, all the states do as Utah do, do vote by mail? So I don't know why people are opposing that. You know, just different things that it seems like they're just putting roadblocks in the way so people don't uh, get there, get out there and vote. Because uh, someone just the other day was saying, and I can't remember who it was, that they had actually won an election by one vote. And then uh, I know it was a judge. And then, but it was in a different different setting and they won by one vote but then when they did the recount that person actually won by five votes and so every vote does make a make a make a difference and then uh, here in Utah of course uh, ex-felons are able to vote and a lot of other states haven't done that but Florida last year did that and everybody should have a right to vote and so that's why we're continuing to fight and make sure that everybody you know, regardless if they have been incarcerated or not, they need to make sure that they have the right to vote. Mm, that's great. Uh, again, if you wanna join us with any questions, we are taking questions from the Utah chat, uh, excuse me, the YouTube uh, chat channel and also on email. And you, let's, let me get that address since I botched it earlier. Uh, the email address is clubs at alumni.utah.edu. So you can send questions there. Um, here's a question. Will women's rights in secular society and within the legal framework truly change without those changes being made within religious institutions and traditions as well? Um, so um, Catherine, maybe a little historical context would be nice here. So um, if you have the uh, religious institutions that are a little bit um, reluctant to support these sort of secular, the, the changes that are being suggested in secular society, what did we see in Utah in the early days? Well, I think one of the things you saw in the past nationally was that there's two different approaches, right? Some people say, let's change laws and hearts and attitudes will follow. And then the other side maybe says we need to change attitudes and then laws will follow, right? Those kind of two different approaches to equality. And um, one of the interesting things to me is that in Utah, when women had been voting for 17 years, lost the right to vote, most people had seen that that was fine and then really strongly supported it. There was not unanimous support for women's voting rights um, by any means, but still a large majority, which was unusual at the time. And I think sometimes just changing, right? Like the idea that women had done this and that you'd seen that nothing happened um, was important for people to, to have that experience, those experiments. So that's one thing that helped in the past was that people had seen um, that. But although it's, it's trickier if you're the person in power and you want to add new people to the electorate or things like this, right? That always threatens to shake up the coalition there. And that's an issue. Sure. Professor Bradley? So it, it's always been true that uh, different religious uh, traditions or institutions have 
particular interpretations of the meaning of the role of men and women or individuals in general. Well, one of the things that's most precious and important about America and our structure of government is that that system of meanings and interpretations should be separate from our structure of rules and principles that are embedded in government. And where it gets super messy is when the two uh, weave together. And you know, whenever you have a majority religion, whether it's Baptists in Atlanta, Georgia, or the LDS in Utah, uh, politics and religion sometimes become intertwined. But as um, citizens of this country, we need to guard a, 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 and, and protect that, that difference because the rule of law is what really protects us. Hmm. Uh, it's interesting though, I mean, Janetta religious institutions were certainly the driver in uh, the civil rights movement for uh, black Americans. So um, uh, maintaining that separation, but uh, understanding the tremendous power and influence that religious institutions can have, that's, that's quite a balancing act, isn't it? Yes, it, it really is. Uh, because a lot of our civil rights movements, of course, came from the churches and working with uh, NAACP and other groups and other just community folks uh, working together uh, saw a huge difference in making sure that they were affiliated with the different churches and making sure that uh, church leaders were working together with the civil rights groups. And a lot of times, sometimes they, they didn't always agree on the different approaches that they would take. Uh, and so that's why sometimes you had a divide between uh, the commu community and the churches. But uh, overall, uh, it, was, it was a good mix that the churches you know, were able to work together uh, in the communities. Mm, Representative Kwan, it's always such a, um, a tightrope that you walk, right? Because sometimes the LDS church does weigh in on social issues and sometimes it doesn't. And you just never know where that influence is going to fall. And it's not always the way you expect it. Well, you know, um, the LDS church said that they weren't going to weigh in on this. And indeed, they didn't weigh in for several years um, on uh, ERA. Um, and it, it's not that they said that they did, weren't going to. Um, it's that they hadn't <laughs> for several years. And so it was a surprise that they chose to speak out now um, rather than in the previous two years when Senator DeBacchus had run um, the same bill, basically. So um, there, there was some, some impetus um, that they had, and I, I can't speak to that. But um, I think that, um, that religiosity is a, it's you know, really tricky. Um, uh, in the legislature because my colleagues, uh, they don't, um, they don't want to appear as though um, their own religiosity or um, others influences their votes, um, that it's purely a policy uh, uh, vote. And so it's, I think it's trickier for um, people who are in the same, um, uh, have the same uh, religious background. So what I see, um, you kind of know it, that it's there, but it's not outspoken. And so you kind of have to read through the lines. Um, the bigger issue though, I think um, for the ERA, if I may speak specifically to ERA, is was the Eagle Four because they were quite, um, they were much more vocal than the LDS Church. Now we know the history, um, and maybe um, Dr. Um, Bradley or um, Catherine will want to talk about that history. But um, basically, we are seeing um, that the Eagle Forum came out of, grew out of the LDS Church's very first stance on any national political issue, and that was ERA. Hmm. And so, um, it, you know, it kind of makes sense that the it was the Eagle Forum that was quite um, quite vocal. Interesting. Um, we're dialing down on some time. I, I want to talk about uh, the legacy of the Nineteenth Amendment a little bit. Um, 
yes, women got the right to vote. Yes, women um, are exercising that right, but it is not translating into an equal balance in the seats of power, whether that be business or in politics or whatever. Um, I'd love to hear the theories on why you think that might be a hundred years later. Anyone want to take a stab at that one? Oh, I'll call on you, Jeanette. <laughs> I'll jump in there. Um, we, you know, the most recent um, example of this is the uh, um, the task force, the um, reopening the economy task force, and I, it's the health and economic task force. I think that's the actual name of it. Uh, we didn't see any women. We didn't see any people of color. <laughs> Zero, right. And they're behind the scenes, um, they're advising um, and, uh, but the fact that the governor put together his own task force specifically for, um, uh, for the, our multicultural communities and that had women of color and um, it, it, it says something about the seat of power here in Utah. It says something about being an, an, an um, afterthought. Um, and I, I'm not saying that to criticize the governor because I'm so glad that he does recognize that the pandemic is um, affecting our communities of color at a much higher rate than, um, you know, than, uh, than the um, numbers suggest that they should. Um, so what I'm saying is that um, I think even a hundred years later, uh, we we um, celebrate women, <laughs> we love women, <laughs> but we don't really see women. And and I think that's one of the big reasons why we need to have more women in office. Other thoughts on uh, the 19th Amendment and the 100 years that have followed, legacy. Well, I, this is Janetta, I, I totally agree with Representative Kwan because what we do see is that uh, a lot of women are more so now being involved than in years past. And what we want to see is to have more women being involved because when folks are selecting people to be on the different boards and commissions, it's usually the same ones that keeps rotating over and over again, rotating from one board to another board. And we're looking at trying to see who's doing the picking because a lot of times it is white men that are being selected uh, for these positions and that we don't see uh, people of color being put in the, these positions. And, and if it is, it may be one. And we just don't want to feel like, okay, one is just enough. And we wanna make sure that we we're being recognized uh, around the table on all the different boards and commissions, different task force, and making sure that everybody is being put together like a, a salad bowl. You know, everybody still maintains their own identity, but then making sure that there's a voice because when you silence one voice in one community, then that community is really being recognized. And so we need to make sure that, that we have everybody coming together and you know, being able to, to speak and talk. The task force uh, on the uh, coronavirus, uh, the multi-ethnic task force is a good group of people that from the community as a whole that will be working together and all of the voices uh, hopefully will be heard. Uh, so we're, we're looking forward to making sure that that task force works with uh, other community groups as well. Great. Um, you can maybe incorporate your legacy thoughts into this final question. I wanna leave enough time for all four of you to answer um, this one coming in. Uh, what voting rights and suffrage challenges still need to be overcome. So that's very much in the legacy vein. Uh, Dr. Bradley? Um, I was thinking when Janetta was talking that when, when, we, uh, when women in Utah received the vote in 1870, they could not hold public office. 
And so if you think about all of the different ways that people like Janetta and, and uh, Representative Kwan have entered the room, it's just a whole series of simple steps. I remember years ago, Irene Fisher told me that when, whenever a woman sees an opportunity open up, they need to step up and try for it. And Cece Foxley, a few years after that, told me that whenever a door opens, women need to walk through and enter the room. And we just can't underestimate uh, how important that is for every single one of us women, because other women will follow us. If you look at the University of Utah at this moment in time with a female president and several prominent women in uh, vice presidential roles, you know, it could turn on a dime and change backwards, right? And we've seen that so many times, but it really makes a difference when women can demonstrate to younger women that those sorts of leadership opportunities are possible for them. Mm. Catherine, uh, thoughts on the legacy of the 19th and what, uh, what challenges lie ahead? Yeah, I think as we think back to the steps that it took to get to the 19th Amendment, the ways that women agitated for change, um, the disagreements and um, the divisions that split the movement and split organizations and pitted people against each other, I think we learned that social change is messy and long and takes a lot of time and work. And we can look to past people right here in Utah, leaders like Alberta Henry, Edith Melendez, Alice Kasai. We have so many women who have carried that legacy forward of seeing a need, seeing something that they feel needs to be changed and doing something about it. There's lots of different ways that people have been involved or made change. It's not only in running for office, right? But I think that as we look back um, and look and find these leaders in our past that can help us to one, understand and recognize the barriers that they overcame, but two, I think it can also help us look around and see where are the needs now. For example, with the voter registration on the Navajo Nation, um, projects like the Rural Utah Project that are helping to address and, and, and address those, those barriers for voting registration. There's a lot that can still be done and we can learn from the people in the past and get engaged now. Mm -hmm. Janetta, voting rights and suffrage challenges. Voting rights and suffrage challenge. I think one of the things is making sure uh, that we make sure that we get people registered to vote, but not only make sure that they register to vote, but make sure that they cast their vote. And here in Utah, it is a lot easier because you know we have the mailing ballots, but even at that, making sure that they even mail their ballots in. Because sometimes what we've been seeing too is that people get their ballots, they lose them, uh, they maybe forget to, to mail it in on time, and then they think, oh, my one vote won't count. So they don't, they end up not even making an attempt to drop it off on election day at the, at the polls. And so we just see all of these different things and making sure that, that, that all of our different groups work together and work together for the, for the good of everybody. Because when we win, then everybody wins. And when we talk about uh, the different issues about voting. We want to make sure that, you know, we're working because I know our NAACP for many years, we worked together with the League of Women Voters, uh, the AKA sorority, uh, other groups uh, in the community where we set up in uh, voting uh, places that people can register to vote. But, you know, with the uh, pandemic the way it is now, we we don't know for sure how or how we're going to do it this time, but we'll, we will make an effort and we just, you know, reach out to everybody that want to help to be able to help as well. Um, our time is just about up. Representative Kwan, I, I want you to uh, answer the last question. How do we know when we've arrived at equal rights for women. What is the most significant milestone that we can reach? Is it equal pay? Is it equal numbers in leadership? What are the metrics that you're hoping for? Yeah, several years ago, um, probably decades ago, one of my uh, very dear friends, um, Edie Midko said something to me. Um, she said it in a meeting and I just, it just never left me in maybe a, a dark way to look at this, but she said, 
and that she would consider that women have equality when we have as many mediocre women in leadership positions as we do as men. And that's, <laughs> I'm probably gonna get some pushback on that, but you know, that stuck with me because um, we women, we, we need to be asked several times before we step up. We need to feel like we're, I think it's 70% um, that we have the, the qualifications where men have uh, feel, at, they have it at 20%, something like this. It's hard for us to step um, up and step in. Um, and so for me, I think that um, it's really important for us to lead not only from the front, but from the sides and from the back and from that we, um, we push forward our um, community of women, that we help, we mentor, that, um, um, that we become allies. Um, I don't have to get um, the uh, glory or the recognition, just like Mabel Lee didn't have to way back in the 1920s. She did it because it was the right thing to do. Um, and we can all be allies. We can all uh, work for the good of, of America. You guys are so dynamic and compelling. I'm so grateful for your time and your willingness to, to share from your home, your home <laughs> office um, in this pandemic time and share your thoughts on the 19th Amendment. I hope all the audience will enjoy um, a retelling of this on our YouTube. Please share it uh, with your circles. Thank you so much to the Hinckley Institute as well as the University of Utah Alumni Association for organizing today's discussion. Everyone, thank you again. Really, really appreciate the time. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Stay safe out there. Thanks everyone, take care. Thank you.